So welcome to our third edition of Startup and Angel Online. Um, today, a special edition uh, with uh, four amazing women from the uh, Australian and APAC uh, startup scene. Um, the discussion will be moderated by Natalie, who is based in uh, Adelaide, uh, and our uh, ambassador uh, over there, uh, who is a Stone and Shock resident. Um, so today, uh, we've got a good mix of attendees from uh, all over Australia and probably 10% uh, from, uh, interna from international, uh, ranging from Singapore, uh, Saudi Arabia, and, and Papua New Guinea. Um, so just a few words about uh, me, I'm the founder of Australian uh, the company uh, powering uh, Startup and Angel for close to four years now, uh, partnering with uh, Axel from uh, Emerging Classified Ventures. Uh, and basically, um, you know, in this time of lockdown, uh, we uh, continue our mission to uh, connect uh, entrepreneurs uh, from Australia and from all over the, the, the globe, um, growing uh, internationally and finding the, the, the best talents uh, locally. Um, Today, uh, we also launched, uh, basically, uh, just three weeks ago, no, uh, an online community uh, with Startup and Angels. Um, a lot of uh, you uh, attending the event today are uh, actually already part of this community. Uh, you know, we really encourage you to, uh, to sign up, uh, basically promote uh, your own company, some of your wins. Uh, any uh, online, um, as well as uh, basically connecting with fellow entrepreneurs uh, and investors. Okay, uh, no, we can't actually meet physically. I think it's uh, very important to uh, have this forum uh, to uh, get to know each other, help each other in in, in this uh, time. So we all uh, get um, stronger uh, when we can uh, finally uh, resume more uh, activities. Uh, so the purpose of, uh, of these events like today is actually to uh, uh, share uh, a number of knowledge and point of view. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I'll ask uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie Take uh, to uh, basically uh, introduce us with, uh, with the topic and, uh, and, and our uh, fellow panelists today. Thank you so much and I'll see you at the end of the event. Um, thank you, Leo, and thank you to all the Australian team to organize this uh, third uh, Startup and Angels uh, event online. So my name is uh, Nathalie Take, and I am uh, based in uh, Adelaide in South Australia in Low 14, as you can see behind me, <laughs> uh, as uh, Leo said. So I am the founder of and CEO of two uh, wine startups, so Botley and uh, eBotley. Uh, the first one, Botley, offers to wine lovers um, Australia-wide monthly discoveries of premium and luxury French and Australian wines selected by her sommelier. And the second startup, eBotley, guarantees the traceability of the bottles in order to fight against counterfeiting by uh, integrating IoT and blockchain tools. So let me introduce uh, today our three female entrepreneurs and investors, speakers. Uh, we are very happy to welcome uh, Kim Theo, based in Melbourne, uh, Cheryl Mack, based in Sydney, and um, Anna Janfield, based in, uh, in Sydney too. So we will expose different visions of the situation to our community from founders, as Kim, investor, uh, as uh, Anna, and the head of community uh, has uh, Cheryl. So could you introduce your role and your organization? So Anna, do, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. And just want to take the opportunity to thank you, Natalie and Leo, for organizing this great event. Um, so as Natalie mentioned, my name is Hannah Field. I'm a principal on the investment team at Tempest Partners. Uh, and we are investing in the next generation of impossible companies. Um, just a bit about my background. So I started my technology career in the Bay Area. Um, so I worked at Pandora Internet Radio, which unfortunately didn't survive too long in Australia. Um, and then after that, uh, worked for a couple of years at Dropbox when they were in sort of their early hyper growth stages. So was one of the founding members of their account management team that built out their B2B strategy for Dropbox for work. Uh, was on the landing team to build out their first international 
office in Dublin, Ireland. Um, so owning my function in EMEA and then moved to Australia to join what was a tiny little startup called Canva. Um, and obviously now they're, <laughs> they're very different than uh, when I joined them back in uh, 2013. So um, made my way over to the investment side of things, um, but certainly have worked in the, the guts of uh, a few different startups and, and really pleased to now be um, enabling other founders to, to really fulfill their ambitions. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, Kim, do, do you want to introduce you? Welcome. <laughs> Should take myself off mute. Um, yeah, Kim, CEO and co-founder of a startup called uh, Mr. Yum. We are the e-commerce layer for food and bev, so cafes, restaurants, pubs, bars, um, powering their online stores. So that's takeaway right now. Um, that's uh, pick up and local deliveries, and when they get to reopen, to do their table ordering solutions. So think like Shopify for like food and bev. And thank you, yeah, thanks heaps for organizing this event. I'm like, it's crazy that we get to be in all different parts mm -hmm. of Australia. Um, virtually on the same on the same panel and super excited to be here thank you thank you thank you very much kim and uh, sherry do, do you want to introduce uh, you yeah absolutely uh and again everyone thank you so much for having me this is the only human interaction that i'm getting <laughs> and uh i'm one of those extrovert people that like needs to talk to people every day so i yeah i'm just i'm really happy to be here and to see other people's faces not that i don't love my partner he's nice too um so <laughs> hey guys my name is cheryl uh, i'm currently the head of uh, community and comms at stone and chalk I absolutely love my job because my job is all about helping the residents within our network, the companies uh, that we have succeed better. So that involves helping them get customers, capital, talent, expertise, and creating a really vibrant community. So I think this job was really, um, you know, perfect for me, but I've only been here uh, about nine weeks now. Uh, and uh, some of you may know me a little bit better from StartCon. So I built uh, and created and essentially built StartCon. Uh, I was the CEO of that company for four years where uh, you know, we ran the largest startup and growth conference in Australia. We ran a pitch competition across APAC, which had 600 startups go through it and a $1 million prize. So uh, yeah, startups is my life. And if I can help, I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, we will cover several topics uh, during this uh, panel discussion. And the first question is, uh, how all of you are uh, adjusting uh, to the new ways of working? So what is one thing you struggle the most with or uh, working from your home or enjoy the most? So Kim, uh, your desk is your home. Do you want to, to start? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit uh, easier for me. We've worked out of our home or like we've lived in our office more likely for the last two and a half years so we haven't really had to like go anywhere um but it's a whole office on our own so we don't have our team with us which has been mm -hmm. I think um pretty challenging it's also presented a lot of opportunities which I'm sure Hannah and Cheryl will touch on as well um I think there's a lot of efficiencies actually that you gain from having your team not have to travel very far um you know driving 45 minutes or being stuck in traffic or having to deal with uh, traffic on the way home when they've got kids to get back to like that's always really challenging and I think you can appeal to more people if you kind of take those limits off and I think um, lots of companies like even big companies I think small like startups have tried and tested that stuff for a while but um, I think the bigger companies will realize that it's actually not too hard to do and if you provide people with a bit more flexibility you can probably get a uh, bit of talent all around the world. Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, yeah. Cheryl, you work in a co-working place uh, with added value in long term. So can you speak uh, more about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's like the question of the day. Everyone everyone I talk to is like, whoa, you work at a co-working space. Like, are you guys just totally screwed? And I'm like, no, not at all. Like, uh, the, the kind of rhetoric that we're using is that we have, um, we have ceased our physical operations. So at the moment, uh, although Natalie seems like she's in our office um, and you know as you can see there's no one there so uh, we, we have uh, discontinued the physical part of our operations but stone and chalk in particular you know I can't necessarily speak for every co-working space but stone and chalk in particular um, was always so much more than just the desk 
So, you know, one of like our secret sauce is really around connecting people within our network to help them commercialize. And that comes back to why I love my job because I get to help people commercialize better. Um, so we've, we've been able to continue to do that. I think for us, the struggle has been that, uh, you know, with our team being physically present, it's a lot easier to go and like talk to somebody when, you know, a corporate comes and like, oh, we want to talk to this person. Like, oh, great. Go talk to that person. Okay. Now you can do the connection. Um, and now having to do that hundred percent virtually is, you know, it's a little bit, there's, there's, you can see there's some inefficiencies. And so that's, that's part of what I'm trying to solve, um, you know, to, to be able to do what we do really well, but also be able to do it virtually. So yeah, not too much has changed, but a couple of things. <laughs> yes. And uh, you do an amazing work. Uh, and I know because uh, my desk is in Stone and Shag, so I, I can see uh, <laughs> from my part. Yes. And Anna, what is uh, one thing you struggle the most uh, with uh, walking from your home or uh, enjoy the most? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just echoing, I think what the others have said, and, and Kim, you sort of nailed this on the head, I think I definitely don't miss the commute time. Um, in some ways, I feel like I'm actually more productive. I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I know I'm the opposite of you, Cheryl, but um, I work really well in solitary environments and getting into my zone. So um, in some ways, this has actually been amazing for me. Obviously, the downside is um, I absolutely love my team, um, and we work in a small, intimate environment, and uh, there's unbelievable banter that happens in real life, and it's it's hard to recreate that over Slack, right? And I think we've done a good job of really leveraging our comms tools to to keep that alive. And we do a daily stand up, um, very much kind of mirroring as you would a, a software engineering team, and um, and so we're very much across all of the touch points that are happening across the firm. Um, I think probably the hardest thing for me, which was unexpected. Um, it's just using Zoom all the time as a medium of communication. And um, one of the things I've learned about myself is um, I think there's just so much that we pick up through conversation that's subconscious and, you know, nonverbal cues, tone of voice, um, sort of real time feedback. And, and I, I find Zoom requires a lot more cognitive focus to really understand what's happening in conversation. And, and I don't mean just casual conversations. Sometimes you're working through really challenging conversations and doing that over Zoom as a platform um, isn't quite the same. So I think for me, as sort of at the end of a day of Zoom calls or the end of a week of just jam-packed Zoom calls, I, I find myself totally drained. So I've been trying to use the weekends to really recharge and, um, you know, just take time for myself away from the screen and, um, you know, make sure that I spend time outdoors and get those breaks in to, to alleviate the cognitive load. <laughs> Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, in, def in terms of uh, impact, um, how has your industry and organization been uh, impacted uh, to date? So, Kim, you are the CEO and co-founder of uh, Mr. Hume. Can you talk us uh, more about it, uh, about this? Uh, hospitality is, like, mm. really struggling, you know, like travel and hospitality are the two most impacted um, industries, I would say, and like impacted just like so incredibly quickly. Like one, one day they were trading and the next day everyone's revenue went to zero. Um, and it happened in like a week. So you had no time at all to plan for what was about to happen or even think about what you would do with your teams or think about what kind of business you would pivot into. Um, and we stayed pretty close to our customers. So we kind of watched the transition of attitudes and uh, I guess like behaviors over the last five weeks and also like sentiment. So at the start, it was um, just absolute like super crash distress, like anxious, like just not knowing what to do with this company that they, this business that they spent the last few years building or some even longer and all the teams that had believed in them and counted on them for um, income. And then probably by about week three, when the, um, you know, announcements around JobKeeper and all that sort of stuff came out. I think there was, and, and the six months, like I think the government continuing to enforce that it was going to be six months really helped them go, okay, well, it's not going to change anytime soon. So it became like, what can I do as opposed to just complete distress? Um, and that, and now it's like opportunistic. Like I feel like the food and beverage industry still feels like really destroyed, but the best um, operators are coming out and trying to be creative and opportunistic and try new stuff that they've never tried before and 
like anything is a go, you know, like anything is possible. Um, and that attitude will create a stronger food and bed business. The, be- the business, the hospitality industry was already like 3% margins before. It was like death by a thousand cuts. Year on year, it would get worse and worse. And I feel like this has just completely accelerated um, the change that needed to happen. It needed to happen at some point. This has like completely accelerated that change. And I think they'll come out actually stronger than they were as an industry before. Um, but it was harsh like a real really really harsh um disruptive two or three weeks for the industry but lots of them are getting back up and trying new stuff so it's really really encouraging really encouraging yeah, yeah. thank you very much for your sincerity and Cheryl you are the, the national head of community and comes at Stone and Shad, so I can see uh, yes that here in Adelaide so how do you manage uh, that yeah, so for Stone and Chalk, we recognized pretty early that this, you know, had the potential to have a big impact on us as a company. Um, and we we decided, I think it was probably pretty early in the game that we we wanted to um, put the safety of our staff as well as the safety of our residents as number one priority. And we weren't really willing to risk some of those um, potential contact points. So that is uh, part of the reason why we closed our facilities uh, in terms of like the physical operations. Um, And in doing so, we also recognized that uh, a lot of our residents were struggling financially, um, or actually not necessarily struggling financially, but were concerned about their financials and um, what that meant for them in the future. And so we we made the decision to waive their rental fees for three months, um, just to give them that little bit of extra um, kind of peace of mind. So um, that's sort of chalk. When I look at our uh, portfolio of companies that are involved in, um, that are part of Stone and Chalk, I think what I see is, uh, you know, I would say maybe about 50% of them haven't really seen that big of a impact. And maybe that's a yet um, thing, but, uh, you know, most of them have been, you know, growing steadily. Their customers have, uh, haven't been uh, impacted too much and they've got contracts and, and they're still kind of working through those things. And they, of course, are still, uh, you know, looking to reduce their costs as well. And then there's another smaller portion um, that have been uh, pretty impacted and seen a big drop off in those would be in the in the industries that you would expect. So like, uh, you know, in, in anything to do with tourism or travel, um, those ones saw a pretty big hit. And then there's a very few that actually have seen uh, an, a, a growth and, uh, you know, a really positive impact on their business because of this. And again, those would be in industries you would expect like healthcare and, um, and anything to do with like home delivery. So it's pretty interesting to, to be able to see what's going on with the, you know, 230 odd companies that are part of our um, residency and see that breakdown between which ones are, you know, thriving in this, which ones are being impacted. But the reality is the majority of them haven't been super impacted uh potentially maybe not yet but i hope that that uh, remains the case for them mm. yeah sure definitely um so anna what is uh, the impact for an early stage venture or a capital firm as tempus um how was your industry and organization being impacted yeah i mean as a whole obviously and um uh, the two other ladies really mentioned this like I think we've never seen anything like this before and hopefully we'll never see like anything like this in the rest of our lifetimes. And it's really unprecedented how something like this has impacted all industries and even companies that are doing well. Um, you know, there, there will be a ripple effect um, from an employment perspective, um, economically. Um, you know, I think we can learn a lot from sort of prior lessons. And, and I think often in the rhetoric in the industry landscape, people point to the GFC and the dot com um, bust. And, um, you know, if you sort of look at what happened during those two periods, you know, it took between four and six quarters, respectively, for, for investment volumes to actually recover after that. That's quite a long time. That's, that's a lot, you know, a lag. Um, before we saw those investment volumes recover. So I think we're just sort of at the start of things. And, um, you know, I do sort of anticipate um, kind of those volumes to, to drop, but it's sort of hard to say. It's still early to really speculate and, and really have a clear view of what's going to happen sort of longer term. Um, I guess with respect to the Tempest portfolio, you know, we've been very fortunate. Um, we actually didn't have any companies that were directly exposed to things like travel or hospitality 
um, you know, some of those obvious industries that were, were nailed pretty hard. On a personal level, my, my partner works for a travel and sure tech startup. So I sort of, feel, you know, feel the pain of, of how difficult that is. And, um, you know, that's extremely difficult for those founders. But um, uh, at a portfolio level, we've actually had a number of our companies um, see a real spike and, and have demonstrated incredible creativity out of the situation. Um, we have an ed tech company called Blonde that's based out of the UK and um, uh, the UK government has a free meal scheme. So providing, you know, sort of the one free meal a day that a lot of kids in uh, kind of underprivileged backgrounds actually receive. And, um, you know, when schools were closed, there's actually no way for those kids to, to get their hot meal of the day. And so in under a week, they built a platform that enabled, um, uh, enabled schools to distribute vouchers um, so that they could go to their local Tesco's and get their um, get their meal for their their child. So, um, you know, examples like that have been incredible. Uh, one of our companies, Swoop, is is manning operations without actually being in the country in Malawi and uh, delivering COVID testing kits to regional remote areas. And um, you know, just huge interest um, in terms of. How do you actually transport supplies? How do you deal with logistics of um, you know, really critical healthcare goods um, in areas that people can't access them and you don't necessarily want to bring them to clinics? Um, so I, I think from that perspective, you'll see absolutely some you know, industries that are very hard hit and, and unfortunately as a result, some companies um, will really suffer through that. And, and then I think on the other side, you know, often in, in scarcity comes wild creativity and, and learning how to navigate these really challenging times and, and pivot and deliver solutions that no one would have ever imagined, but suddenly this new environment creates an urgency around that uh, and a real demand, so. Yes, yes um, if we think about uh, the, the next horizons of uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, what opportunities do you see arise uh, during or after this crisis and uh, how will uh, the new world uh, look like? Uh, Kim, wh what is your opinion? Oh, so hard to say. We're like in week six of um, a crisis that I've never lived through before. Um, obviously, like Hannah said, you know, you. I listen to a lot of stuff about people that have been through the GSC, but I do think this is quite different. Um, this is like a health crisis that's led into an economic crisis, um, which maybe is unveiling some like fundamental things that weren't right about our like debt levels and our economy, but it wasn't like fundamentally an economic crash. So um, it's hard to know if it will take four to six quarters, like Hannah said, to recover or maybe shorter, maybe longer. And that completely depends on, I think, if we find a vaccine for this or not. Um, I think unless we do, like, we're still going to live in a lot of fear. Um, what's happened in Singapore has, like, just, I think, sent the world into um, doubt around, like, the belief that you can do contact tracing and be super cautious and keep this at bay. It's absolutely, like, blown up there over the last four, month, four days and my parents live there. So I'm, like, well across the situation that they're facing. And they went from being, like, model coronavirus country to, like, it's all up in the air now, like nothing. There's no one to look to that has the answer of how to keep this uh, situation. So I think the, yeah, it'll be, it'll be this until we find a vaccine or like some level of, of this. Um, but I think more broadly opportunities, it's really, that's like, I think case by case and industry by industry, but I do think there's some, um, there's some like mindset shifts that will be uh, prevalent across every, industry and those are you know when your parents used to say like stop spending that money and like keep that money for like a rainy day and you're like what do you mean a rainy day mm. like our generation <laughs> have never lived through like yes. rainy days like we we just never understood you know like it's always been you put money into property property just grows like surely look at the chart it's grown 10 years in a row you know like you put money into the stock market look at the stock market grow like our generation have not seen uh, a recession. We don't understand assets going down in value. We don't understand, like we just never, we, like that, that's millennials. Um, and we take things for granted and we're super like entitled and we think there's gonna be jobs, like we can leave a job and get a job tomorrow. Like there's just no appreciation for hardship. Um, so I think that's the thing that will change. If this continues for six to nine to 12 months, 
um, everyone is going to know someone that is absolutely in a rough, like a really bad financial position because of this. Um, and that person will not be someone you've ever expected to be in a rough financial position. Like they didn't do anything wrong. They were doing all the right things, working really hard and still completely screwed over by um, the situation. And I think people will be less entitled and more grateful and hopefully more resilient out of the situation. Um, like less, less like Avon toast and more like savings in your bank. I think that's what will happen. And we will then be able to tell our kids like save that money for a rainy day. <laughs> it's almost like it has to happen every generation for us to realize that it's not, um, yeah, it's not just like growth charts that look like this and like sunshines and rainbow all the time. So um, yeah, I think that is probably the main mm -hmm. shift in mindset and opportunities will present at different times for different industries. Um, mm -hmm. And there'll be lots of them, so yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. And so, uh, <laughs> Sherry, what uh, opportunities do you see arise uh, during and after this crisis? Yeah, so I think there's going to be a couple of things that will um, that will absolutely change uh, moving forward. So, you know, just to Kim's point, I do hope that that you know this environment it creates uh, a new generation of more compassionate people and people that uh, you know understand and are more willing to work together and more willing to help their neighbor. And um, you know, I think Australia has generally been okay at that, but we could do better. And in particular, there are other countries um, that could definitely do a lot better in that sense. And I, I hope that that's what we see. Um, in terms of like what, what I think like in our, in our, in the physical sense, like what is going to change? I think there will be a much bigger emphasis on uh, domestic manufacturing. This whole thing has, uh, has highlighted that there are gaps and when we can't rely on imports to fill those gaps, well, where does that leave us, right? So um, I'm already seeing this from, you know, from some of the, the conversations that are happening with government that they're coming back and being like, oh yeah, I remember when we outsourced all of that, uh, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. Maybe we should actually have some stuff on, on shore. So I think that's gonna be a big shift for a lot of countries to start bringing manufacturing back on shore for essential items. Um, and for the record, I'm not talking about toilet paper that is already manufactured on shore. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm talking more about like medical stuff. Like we, we don't have enough testing kits. Why is that? You know, how come uh, Sweden or Switzerland or one of the Scandinavian countries can test every person in their country and we can't? Well, you know, that's where that stuff is made, right? So I think there's going to be a, a much bigger consideration of that. Um, the other thing is the, the whole working from home. Um, I think it was actually Hannah that mentioned this. Once you let them out, you can't get them back in. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to me, the number of like big companies, and, and I unfortunately happen to be um, best friends with a bunch of, all my best friends are accountants and they work for all the big four companies. Uh, so I'm, I'm surrounded by them all the time. And you know, all the, all the excuses as to why they couldn't work from home, oh, the VPN, you know, oh, security this, oh, you know, we can't this this and that. And all of those things just suddenly are no longer an issue, right? So you can't go back and be like, oh yeah, actually, yeah, we're concerned about security now. So you got to come in the office, right? So, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot more flexibility in terms of, of how people can work. Um, but, you know, I think that will also come with a certain level of responsibility and, um, you know, give and take in terms of trust. And that will hopefully, I think, create better managers and, and better working relationships in the long run. But I'm an optimist at heart. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Anna, can you complete uh, what is for you the, the next horizons? Yeah, I mean, I think Sh Cheryl had a big one that I was going to touch on, which is, yeah, just this different shift in attitude towards flexible remote working and distributed teams. And um, yeah, we were actually talking about this the other day. And, and Kim, I think you mentioned, you know, software engineers have actually been doing this for a long time. And it's because their modal, their modality of work is actually online. It's always been virtual and um, creating real rigor around documentation and communication over communication. And I think that's just not the native language that non-engineers actually operate in and or with. And um, I think, yeah, absolutely. Like this idea that traditional modes of working require bums on seats sitting in an office and how many hours are you in the office um, will become sort of an archaic notion and it will become, you know, it will be a shift towards what are the deliverables and the, the quality of those deliverables become the measure of your success at work. And I think that's super important. And 
you know, I don't think, um, you know, particularly living in a place like Sydney, that's extremely expensive. You know, the cost of talent is very high here. And, um, in, and one of the side effects of actually what's happening right now is, unfortunately, a lot of people are getting made redundant and um, companies are shutting down. But um, there's a real opportunity as well. If you are building a company, the cost of capital is much cheaper, the, the competition is far less. Um, so the ability to find amazing talent who are now actively on the job market is much easier. Um, and so I think, you know, currently we're all working remotely. So we're going to have to get adjusted to this idea of, um, I've never met you before, but like, let's, let's hire you. And even though we've never met face to face or, um, you know, for investors, it's going to be, you know, we've never actually met you before, but we have a series of meetings and we deep dive in the way that we would in person. And, um, I can't actually meet you physically, but, um, I will invest in your company. And that's like a 10 and 15 year bet. So um, I think there's gonna be some real significant changes in terms of what we are willing to do today um, that we didn't necessarily consider before. Now from an investment landscape, I think there's sort of intuitive areas that we'll see a rise of companies and, and opportunities. Um, I, I've chatted about um, one of our sort of logistics, uh, drone logistics companies, Swoop, um, but broadly, I think logistics, supply chain, transportation, those areas, um, you know, companies who are sort of reimagining those, those assets and sort of how that actually operates in today's world um, will change a lot. I think, you know, e-commerce, obviously, um, you look at some of the stats in, in America where you know, Walmart is, is trying to hire 150,000 hourly workers just to sort of fulfill orders. Um, digital health, I think it's going to change a lot in healthcare. Um, I'm seeing really positive trends, even from the investment pipeline side of things of um, digital healthcare companies that may have um, run into a lot of friction around telehealth and um, Medicare saying, uh, you know, we're not going to actually cover that service. And then suddenly, yeah, exactly. And suddenly, um, you know, unfortunately, but in a way, I'm glad people are leveraging the service, but mental health services have absolutely skyrocketed. I mean, people are really struggling and they need professional support and they should be covered. Um, and so I'm seeing really positive trends in that direction. And for companies who are facilitating that um, through greater efficiencies, or maybe it's the underlying technology that supports that, um, I think that's going to be growing. And then Sorry, there's a wee bunker outside. I don't know if that's very loud on my end, but um, <laughs> someone has decided to start mowing in front of our lawn. <laughs> um, and then I think the last area is education, right? Um, we have, you know, globally tens of millions of kids who, you know, hundreds of millions of kids will be staying at home. Um, how are we going to educate them? And what are the tools that are required to ensure that they're not totally left behind in the next X number of months of this reality? Um, and so I think, you know, all of the tools that are sort of facilitating that and ensuring that we can deliver um, education to kids um, as, as best we can, right? It's not a perfect scenario, but um, companies that are sort of reimagining how that works and, and dis distributing education in a way that allows them to access it from anywhere, I think will be really critical. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see the, the perspectives for founders in terms of capital raising. Um, in your opinion, what are the perspectives for founders? Uh, in, what do you think, Kim? Um, I think it's pretty confusing. <laughs> <laughs> if I'll be honest, like, um, you know, we did a seed round in May. Last year, we uh, definitely were planning our next round. We've actually managed to extend our runway a lot out to like 18 months now because our team has been like absolute rock stars. Um, but, and with JobKeeper, of course, that's going to be incredibly helpful for us. Um, but we're still thinking about when we try and do our next round and what do we need to um, take into consideration. Like there's lots of, conflicting advice you know um some are saying we're still open for business others are saying yes but I val but your valuation is going to be crunched um others are saying well if you can raise money in this market and you can get ahead of your competitors then um it might be worth the valuation like the lower valuation that you're up for um I was listening I was actually on a webinar with the Aconex founder um the other day in kind of a small group and he was saying that they raised a lot of money through the GFC 
and he thinks that really, really helped them. Um, and the way that he saw it, which was like the best, like the clearest thing that I've heard, and I've been listening to a lot of things, um, is that if you think the dilution in your company is smaller than what your growth will be because of that capital, then you should do it. So, you know, if you can, if you if the capital comes at a lower price and you dilute a little bit more than what you previously expected, or you reduce the amount that you're trying to raise, um, but that allows, say, say you do a 20% dilution, but that allows your company to grow by more than 20%, um, then, you know, it's worth the, it's, it's a good trade-off and it's a really like clear, logical way to think about it. And that's probably been like the clearest thing um, that I've heard. So I think founders, now need to figure out um, how they can prove that they are a business that will grow in like the next, grow in a recession, grow because they're getting closer to their customers, grow because they are transforming um, their industry and they're helping the, the industry through a transformation of some sort. Um, and if you can, then you probably shouldn't be too afraid of going out and raising at some point over the next six months. Um, but if you're, I guess, trying to hibernate completely, I think that'll be hard. I think if you're like literally in hibernation mode and you're not, um, yeah, you're not trying to grow in these times and you're trying to like just preserve as much cash as you can until the industry reopens again, then I think it'll be a bit more challenging to raise. So I think it's a, yeah, I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm just as confused, you know, and I'm sure like next week I'll say something different or I'll hear something different. Um, and I'm sure Hannah has like her perspective, which I'm excited to hear about. And I think every fund is trying to do the right thing and coming out and saying what their perspective is. So the more investors that can come out and help us understand uh, what they're thinking right now, what they're looking for, how they're thinking about valuations, what's the risk to reward ratio, like the more investors that can put out more material about that stuff, I think it's going to help the Australian startups figure out what their next move is. Mm -hmm. Yes, de definitely, yes. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Cheryl, what is your um, point of view? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, question of the day, isn't it? Uh, so um, from my perspective, I, you know, I've, I've recently done a bit of work um, on a report for the Australian government regarding early stage investment. And so luckily I was already in touch with uh, 40 plus um, angels and VCs. And so I did take, uh, you know, take some time to have a chat with, um, with quite a few of them personally about this. And I essentially, you know, asked them like, hey, what's the new normal? Like, has, has this changed or is it not changing anything? Um, and I ended up compiling that into, uh, into an article. Um, so I'll post that later. But um, essentially what I learned was that, uh, you know, there are different, uh, different areas of investment that are being affected differently. So uh, the vast majority of angels that I talked to um, came back with, look, we're, you know, we're kind of parked at the moment. Um, with the exception of Sydney Angels, uh, as a syndicate, they are still going through their regular uh, deal flow processes. So that was really encouraging. Um, but in terms of that early stage uh, funding and particularly early stage new deals, I think we're going to see uh, quite a bit of an impact there and uh, getting, getting that new, uh, new deal, whether it's from Angel or VC, but getting that new deal uh, in a time like this is going to be really tough. The bar seems to be definitely higher um, on new deals. In terms of VC, the vast majority of VCs told me that they are still open for business. They are still planning on making, um, you know, making investments at the same pace. And I, uh, and you know, a couple of them even told me that their, you know, their criteria has not changed. Um, although, you know, that tended to be the much larger funds than the smaller funds. Uh, so it's it's worth keeping in mind who you're approaching. I think the general advice is that um, if you can extend your runway, extend your runway as much as you can with the cash that you do have. If you do need to raise money, um, my thought, and this is uh, purely my own personal opinion, uh, if you do need to raise money in order to kind of make it through this and, and get to the next milestone that changes your valuation, then it might be better to do so sooner rather than later. Uh, as, you know, as we go through you know, the next 12 months, a lot of the VC funds are going to be deploying a lot of their capital. And that might mean, I'm not saying it will, but it might mean that later on there might be less money in the market. Um, if, you know, these, these economic times uh, have as big of an effect that we think it will. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when, 
when you look at what the, you know, I guess my point here is that in these difficult times and in, you know, economic downturns, inefficiencies in business tend to come out and tend to be a lot more obvious. So these are things that if you, you are going to look to raise money, that investors are going to be looking at a bit more closely than, uh, you know, they might otherwise um, have done so. So yeah, uh, I'll post the link to the article and Hannah, obviously at Tempest, um, yeah, probably has uh, an opinion there as well on, on what her firm is doing. So uh, Hannah? <laughs> yeah, I'll jump in because the mower literally just stopped. So get in my word now. Um, yeah, I mean, and Kim, I'm sure there's like a lot of kind of a opposing viewpoints and that must be very confusing for founders. So um, when I sort of speak with my view, it's on um, the Tempest side and not really don't want to speak for other firms. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly are still allocating capital um, for primary investments. So still looking to back um, exceptional founders and, and um, you know, still very busy from a pipeline perspective and looking to make several more investments in the next kind of six to eight months. So um, I think I think the initial shock when everything happened, um, you know, a lot of firms, the initial priority is naturally to look at your portfolio company, to understand what's happening, what is the macro um, dynamics that are unfolding and how does that actually impact um, each and every company and that involves a lot of time um, with founders looking at balance sheets, looking at how do we extend runway. Um, and, and, and I think in the old days, there was sort of a view like runway is 12 months, like you'll be all right. But for us, it was how do you actually extend the runway for 18 to 24 months? Like what is the worst case scenario? And let's actually model out worst case scenario, what's a lesser worst case scenario, what's an okay scenario, what's an ideal scenario, and really just be honest and, and eyes open about the reality. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think that's really the only way to, to approach it. And, and based on sort of those conversations, understanding where there are redundancies, where there, where is their government stimulus, things like job keepers, um, the, the female founders grant, um, you know, can something be done about R&D tax incentives and what's actually happened there. Um, so I think there's a lot of work uh, as well on the side lines from great organizations who are advocating at the government level to, to really protect the startup sector. So um, I think the initial maybe reverberation that was felt in the market is the firms sort of directly focusing on portfolio companies just to make sure that they were all right and understand, you know, how do we think about um, those follow-on fundings and what is required to ensure these companies continue to survive through this period and it's hard because we don't know how long this period will last um but i think you know for us we've continued looking at, at new companies and i mean we look at between six and seven hundred companies a year um and i would say in the last week alone we've probably looked at 12 new companies so we're still very much um meeting founders and um you know still actively to look to make investments one thing cheryl mentioned um which um, i just want to call out is is like really strong unit economics and, and as a firm, you know, our investment mandate and how we evaluate potential investment opportunities has not changed. Um, it's not like COVID, cha uh, COVID entered and then suddenly our rubric has changed. Um, we've always wanted to back founders who, you know, obviously you need to raise capital to build and scale a business, but it needs to, in the long run, have sustainable, scalable unit economics and it, it just has to make sense. And so, um, we think very hard about that and think deeply about that um, before we make an investment and um, amongst many other things, but looking at those 10 year horizons, um, you know, we want to be making long term um, bets on these companies and I don't think, you know, good foundational um, business plans and structures and um, that shouldn't be underestimated in terms of companies that um, will potentially weather the storm what vertical they're in is a totally different matter. And, and sometimes, um, you know, those things can't be helped, but um, I think that is an important thing to call out. Um, I think, Kim, you sort of mentioned this question about how much to raise and valuation. And, and what I would say is, you know, if you have the capacity to sort of adjust your raise amount um, and consider proportionally sort of adjusting your vow um, to maintain that dilution um, just to get through this period, I think that's something that's definitely worth considering. Um, 
And, you know, as always for all founders, whether this is COVID or not COVID, being really clear and articulating what is your value proposition, not just for this period, the story is not about COVID. The story is about what am I building for the future? And what does my business look like? And, and it's a decades long ambition, right? And so don't let the narrative be driven by COVID. Um, equally, you will naturally get questions about, you know, how do you weather certain macro factors and that kind of thing. But, and, and like, it would be silly not to kind of point some of those things out, um, but make sure that your story for venture capital investors is really about the longer term horizon um, because it could be COVID today and it might be another GFC, you know, five years from now, um, we just don't know, but these are the sorts of companies that can really weather that storm. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Hall, uh, please feel free to ask your question, uh, yes, to the panelists in the QA uh, section of Zoom. Um, uh, the, the last question, so um, as a woman, what has been the most amazing and expected thing uh, during this period uh, has brought to your life? Um, and especially we had some question from Gladys uh, about uh, to be women, uh, what are uh, uh, in this situation, uh, how do you think this situation can change or alter women funded companies, opportunities, risk? Uh, Kim, you want to, I think, uh, share uh, something extra about survival in this period? Uh, I mean, yeah, the thing I wanted to mention was like when we're talking about raising capital, um, like one thing we've been really challenging ourselves to do is just like, how do you get profitable? Like your runway is only dependent on the burn of the company so if you can find a way to reduce your cost and i think this has taught us all like a hard lesson about how far you can go with cost reduction it is amazing you're like wow i really didn't need that i thought i needed that i don't need that anymore like it's insane and i think we've like worked super hard and i think a lot of startups have to like get their costs right down and when you look at your cost and you look at your revenue you're like holy shit i'm not even that far from becoming profitable and if i can do that then capital isn't really capital is just for growth. It's like literally not for survival. And I think that is like where, you know, if, if, if startups can force themselves to think like, how do I get to a point where start where capital is a growth opportunity rather than survival, then um, they put themselves in a much less risky situation for if this does actually turn out to be a 12 month, um, you know, um, a policy. Um, and around being a woman, I, I think, when when that when Gladys posted that question, I was like, how interesting! Like I hadn't really even considered, um, you know, how guys would be dealing with this compared to how girls would be dealing with this. I think one thing is like, girls have always been the kind of people to like get on the phone and talk to their friends and socialize and like, like, doing group calls with other girls is probably more common than like boys getting on the phone with each other and like growing out. They're more likely to go down to the pub and do it whereas girls are more likely to connect over like the, the phone or, or even like chat groups or just like like little things that um, I think women do that maybe isn't as like similar to guys. They just like don't talk for each other for like a week and then they might decide to go down to the pub and grab a drink. So um, I think actually the, the, like, the, uh, the, the nature of how we communicate with each other is maybe even put us in a better situation um for COVID but I don't I don't know if investors like I don't think it's going to change I mean yeah I'm not I don't think it's going to largely change um whether there's more money into female founders or less money into female founders that sort of stuff I think maybe women will find it less uh lonely and less um you know depressing than than guys just because we're more used to picking up the phone and like calling a girlfriend that's like on the other side of the world compared to what guys might be so it's probably more social and like well-being thing rather than like a more money into female founders thank you and uh, Cheryl what has been the most amazing and unexpected thing uh, this period has brought to your life <laughs> yeah honestly um I don't know if anything like truly amazing has happened to me <laughs> I'll be totally honest <laughs> Um, and, and in particular, uh, I don't think anything truly amazing has happened to me because I'm a woman. Um, I, I definitely like tend to shy away from those types of things. Although I absolutely am a huge, you know, supporter and, you know, I mentor for 
uh, you know, I'm a CEO activator. I've mentored for She Starts. Like I'm, I'm absolutely a huge supporter of, of um, female founders and women in business in general. Um, but, you know, I think I'm not really like in this kind of economic environment, I'm not really thinking about women and men differently or separately. I did mention uh, in answer to that question that, uh, you know, I do think that in the past, there's been a bit of a kind of stigma around, oh, you know, you're building your company from home. Oh, you're, you're building your company while working flexible hours. Uh, that is, you know, kind of maybe felt a little bit like, oh, you're, yeah, you're not as focused, right? Um, so I think that that stigma will probably be removed because if everyone's working flexible hours and everyone's, um, you know, working from home while dealing with kids and we're figuring it out, then, you know, maybe that won't be something that is, um, is considered. Not saying that all VCs or investors do that. I certainly don't think that Tempest does. I can see Hannah grinning. Um, but I, I can absolutely tell you that I've heard that um, from, from some. And so, you know, I think maybe, maybe this will help us move towards a place where uh, women founders are not uh, judged differently from um, their male counterparts when there is absolutely no need to do so. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, what about you, Anna? Uh, um, what has been the most amazing uh, during this period of uh, thing? I'm actually struggling to answer this question because I also, um, it's funny, you sort of sometimes do these panels and then you get like the woman question and you're like, oh, I'm a woman. And so someone cares <laughs> about my view on X. Um, and so I'm kind of with Cheryl, like I, I don't think I'm a woman and I'm dealing with COVID, therefore... <laughs> I am having a distinctly diff different experience. And um, the reality is like, you know, I have a lot of really good guy friends and, and a lot of them are s struggling as much as my women friends are. And I don't think this is, um, I actually don't know if I believe in the premise that this is actually distinctly different experience by gender. And I think it's hard for everybody because we're all human. And, and as much as I claim to be an introvert and I could be like in my dark room all day working, um, you know, there's a part of me that still craves human interaction. And we're actually like, we are human beings and everybody needs human interaction. And we are living in an environment where no one can get that from each other. And um, I think that's really, difficult regardless of age, gender, you know, many of us are separated from our families. And um, I think all of that is extremely difficult. Um, what I would say in terms of women founders and, and something we haven't really touched on is, I think we need to make changes at the investor level. Um, we need more diverse investment teams. We need more women investors, you know, making investment decisions. And, um, and it's something that we as a firm believe passionately about having diverse teams. And we're not just diverse from a gender perspective, we're diverse from, um, in terms of ethnic backgrounds and professional backgrounds, I mean, from all different walks of life. And I think that's extremely important to get cognitive diversity at the table when it comes to allocating capital to founders so that you don't have these blinders and you don't have those situations. Um, Cheryl, you pointed out, it's like, oh, you're building your company from home or you're building a, a, a company in a certain way and somehow that doesn't resonate with my personal point of view. And I think the more that you get diversity at the investment layer, um, the more that you can actually make um, better decisions and, and drive better outcomes from an investment perspective. And there's loads of data floating around in terms of um, uh, diverse investment teams into actual better performance uh, returns um, outcomes. So, um, you know, the question about diversity at the investment level, that's like a whole different kettle of fish and would be consuming of another panel. Um, but I think just um, the TLDR on this is um, certainly in Australia, just broader awareness of um, venture and investing as a, as a career path for women and encouraging women to think about finance as a career path. And, um, you know, we're cultivating a rich generation of amazing women operators who are building companies who have failed to build companies and then built, you know, for the likes of Atlassian and Canva, you know, really mature companies and all the way through that spectrum. And I think that is a massive untapped opportunity to bring those women into the venture um, ecosystem and actually give them the tools and um, sort of enable and teach them to become investors and actually back, um, you know, the next generation of women, women founders. So that would be my sort of takeaway there. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. Yes, if I if I have also to to um, complete with uh, an example with uh, my business, uh, I am in the wine industry and I organize it before the COVID nineteen a uh, lot of events uh, in uh, restaurants uh, with sommelier to introduce uh, Australian wine and French wine. And uh, I have to move to online events and to organize uh, this uh, kind uh, of introduction uh, around wine tasting with wine lovers uh, online. And we were sommelier, and it was at the at the at uh, the beginning uh, an, a hard exercise <laughs> to do online uh, with no sense of contact with people and uh, something like that. Because in wine, you have to smell it to taste it. So it's an exchange uh, more uh, with physical relationships. So. Um, yes, uh, it's quite a difficult period, but we have to to adjust. And um, uh, if um, I will ask you to conclude with uh, one word, what will be your last one word? For me, it will be, uh, I think, uh, flexibility uh, during this period, uh, uh, the thing that I acquire. What will be in one word, uh, Kim, uh, for attendees uh, that you have to suggest or to uh, share today? Uh, Kim, if you have just to say uh, yes, one That word. is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> exercise. Uh, <laughs> what would be um, one word that people have to remember? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of something that's not incredibly, um, like, already heard of. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say probably... Um, like care, like just care about other people and um, like just try and be a little bit of a better listener and, you know, before you get on the phone and try and start selling something, like ask people how they're going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think just, and I think people are already doing that, which is really nice. I think just a little bit more, yeah. a little bit more care. I love your word. Yes, and the cherry, what will be your word? <laughs> My word is focus. Oh, okay. <laughs> focus on your customers, focus on delivering value, focus on what's important for yourself and your company, focus on your health, focus. Okay. And uh, what about uh, you, Hannah? What will be your word? Uh, I think my word would be patience. Um, so patience with yourself. Um, it's sort of a cop-out because I was going to use care as well. I think self-care is extremely important, but being patient with yourself, I think everyone's going through a turbulent emotional roller coaster. And I think um, be forgiving of yourself, but also forgiving of others when um, sometimes we see weird behaviors emerge from these weird times. So um, I think patience all around for each other and knowing that we're in this together is important. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, all of you. I will, uh, Leo, do you want to conclude uh, this uh, session? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nathalie, and uh, each of you for, uh, for sharing uh, your insights. That was a very, very rich uh, discussion. So uh, really a big round of applause, a, a big digital round of applause to, uh, to all of you uh, for this third edition. Um, I think very well received. Also, uh, you've seen some of the, of the poll we, uh, we had during the session. It's always good to see that uh, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, uh, we all, always see opportunity through a difficult time. Uh, and, um, you know, I think you touched a number of aspects that uh, really, um, you know, give, uh, give hope and, and enable us to see through this crisis. So thank you so much for, uh, for your time. Uh, quick, quick wrap up. So this was our, our third edition. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, we, um, we've now launching an online community platform where you can uh, connect, uh, promote your startup, uh, share any resource, um, and uh, share it in particular uh, posted um, in, in the chat. Then your resource will, will share with you, uh, with the community. Um, next week, uh, there's going to be a fourth uh, panel discussion will be uh, traveling to a number of emerging markets to understand the impact on um, their startup ecosystem. So we'll have uh, uh, entrepreneurs from Indonesia, uh, PNG, Nepal, uh, and the discussion will be moderated by my co-founder Axel, uh, who is uh, also the founder of uh, Emerging Classified Ventures. 
uh, operating in over 30 uh, emerging markets. Um, so that, that should be really uh, insightful as well. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, to finish on, uh, on time, uh, you will be invited to uh, you know, fill out a very, very short survey uh, once we finish this uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, so your insight would be uh, very welcome for us to uh, understand how we can uh, continue to uh, give you some, uh, some insight, some resource. Uh, you know, if you want to recommend any, uh, any speakers, uh, that would be amazing. Uh, is, if some of you want to uh, sponsor an initiative, uh, we always uh, up for it. Um, we've been very, very lucky for the next couple of editions. Um, one of our uh, uh, long-term partner, uh, OVH Cloud, uh, is coming back as a, as a sponsor. Uh, and uh, we may actually have a more um, emerging tech platform um, supporting supporting us going forward. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks so much, Natalie in Adelaide. I uh, hope it's, uh, you know, you'll get some, uh, some sun. Uh, Kim in Melbourne and uh, Anna and Cheryl uh, in Sydney. I uh, hope we can uh, obviously all uh, see each other soon in a physical event and enjoy some, uh, some wine, why not? Um, enjoy the rest of your day and, and thank you so much for, uh, for being with us uh, today. Thanks, Leo. Thank you Thanks so much. Everyone. Thanks for organizing. Yeah, bye, guys. See ya. See ya. Bye-bye.